this podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the U.S. and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Joe Bradley. Joe is the chief scientist at Live Person. Joe, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're delighted to have you. So, Joe, let's start with yourself. You've worked for some amazing companies. Can you give us a bit of a background of your journey in tech from where you got started to some of the roles you've held along the way and, and take us up to today? Yeah, the, the rabbit hole goes pretty far if we go all the way back, but it you know it includes things like opera singing and majoring in English literature and being a classroom school teacher and a physicist. There's a, a colorful tapestry back there. I, I consider a lot of that that early work in all those different areas extremely formative for me in terms of learning not only how to be literate in a little bit of a deeper way than we think of it just reading and writing, but to be able to learn to read and write better and better as you go on, uh, which I think is important in any career in the world, period, uh, certainly any knowledge-based career. And also one of the things I feel very passionate about is that to be a leader and a good leader, you need to have a, a good understanding of a variety of perspectives, some of which you may not be familiar with. And, and you need maybe more than that to be willing to find value in that in those perspectives that are very different from your own. So a great scientist should learn from a salesperson. A great scientist should learn from a product manager, right? Uh, in the same way that, that they should want to learn the other way around. Uh, and I think sometimes we miss that. And we, we think of the technical and the science professions in, in the industries as having some degree greater access to the truth. And I just don't believe that. I think it's a different kind of truth. So there's all that. And then a lot of my sort of e-commerce journey or industry journey really begins with Amazon. After being a physicist, I spent a number of years at Amazon working as a lead scientist for targeting and consumer understanding and then building data science groups in the Amazon search environment where we worked to, to really, this was at a time where our goal at Amazon at that point was to lead product search across the internet. And we were trying to wrest some of that away from Google. And so that was a really interesting time to be there and to be working on Amazon's e-commerce product. That that led me to, to Nike, where I worked. You know, Nike, a lot of people have more than one boss. That's sort of the matrix or organization on purpose for innovation, which is interesting. Most companies use matrixing as a way to drive efficiency, but Nike actually has a, a, like a little bit different take on it. But there I led data science for a lot of the brand marketing functions and consumer understanding. So we build lifetime value models. We build targeting models for audiences, uh, which is really cool because people love to hear from Nike. The customers are really excited to hear from them. And I, I really like working for companies where, where people want to get the message and you're not trying to throw the message at them. That's just a better experience and, and more meaningful, I think, for everyone. I, and also a lot of the algorithms for the Nike digital presence. That was the other thing we did. And mixing and matching, of course, because it's the same consumer on it on the same journey, just you see them in different places, whether you're talking about marketing or, or digital. And that led me to Live Person. I, I came on to Live Person three and a half years ago now and started building an organization at, at LP. We really didn't have a lot of language science going when, we, when I started and we knew we had amazing data set to begin with, amazing set of many hundreds of billions or now billions of goal-oriented dialogues, which every academic in the world is working in language wants to have. Uh, and and it was, that was something really to, to base a lot of value on. And I, I think the other piece that's so exciting from a data science perspective is you have this army of people using our platform who are these like agents working for brands, whether they're selling or, or solving customer care problems or whatever they're doing. But they're people who have intimate knowledge of the problems that customers are trying to solve as they go through these conversations and, and they become a source for knowledge for the machine learning algorithms to be trained from, right? This other way of generating what we might call in the industry as annotated data that's very powerful and, and at a very large scale, many tens of thousands of people to leverage in this way. Uh, and we began to build. We built over the course of the last three and a half years, we built a number of natural language understanding products. We've done a lot of innovation and continue to do so on 
dialogue handling and been trying to not only help computers uh, talk to people better, but also use computers and, and use people's language to help them with problems and, and learn from what they're learn from what they're saying so a company can be a better company for their customers. Well, and thank you for sharing that, that background and overview. It's great to hear such a very experienced prior to entering the world of, of data and how you've attributed to a lot of the, your success. I think that's very useful for the audience to hear. I want to continue on focusing on the journey of lawyer person, but just to take a slight step back to help frame the topic and, and give our audience a bit more context for anyone not not familiar with live person explain the business model what is the mission of live person and then we can jump into your role and your team's role with the use of data science and ml to achieve this mission yeah the way i'd say our mission is we want to use technology to help consumers and brands connect more deeply more effectively and in better ways for both parties. And we want to use that to help people solve some of the problems they have in the world more easily. Uh, so what that means for us is there's a number of products that Live Person has in the marketplace today, but the biggest one and the, the sort of center of our business right now is a business to business product. And it's a platform on which brands can manage their customer conversations. And this can be conversations about what we call customer care. So I want to change a password or pay a bill, or I'm having trouble with your goods or your services or something, or return something, thing, all sorts of things like this. I don't understand my bill. And, or commerce, right? So people looking to buy things or to interact commercially in a conversational way. Uh, of those two, the, our history is really derived from the customer care use cases. And so that's, again, like of the center, that's the biggest piece, but we have more and more as time goes on, we're taking on a lot more conversational commercial interactions where customers are really trying to find the right product and the right needs for them. It, it's really interesting what you find when you look at how customers talk to companies rather than click around on their website. I, I had, was looking at a customer conversation with a sporting goods company, the, the company, the, the sporting goods company and I were investigating some of their conversations together. And it, there, were, there were a couple that were really interesting. There was this one woman who was like, hey, I'm shopping for my eight grandkids and my two great grandkids, and I really need help. I'm late for Christmas, right? She was a Christmas shopper. And that one sticks out for me because for a couple of reasons. One, there's all these ways that brand could help her. Oh, do you want help with birthdays next year? Do you want help an early reminder for the holidays next year? There's all sorts of ways going forward. The relationship could be Deepen now that the brand understands the this person's real problem, which is they've got a lot of shopping to do. They've got a big family and they need help with that. And the second thing that stuck out for me was like, this is very much the kind of thing that I would literally ask as an interview question back when I worked at Amazon. One of my favorite interview questions was, how can you tell, like, what, how would you look at the website patterns that somebody generates and try and understand if they were shopping for gifts or not? Because that's a way to adjust the search experience. And, and in this case, this is something that someone sits down and literally is telling to this person. So I think it's very powerful in that because now you're not trying to infer what this person's doing. You know, you have their best interest at heart if you're a company that's like watching their click patterns, like you're trying to help them. But I think you're trying to learn something that they may not know they're really telling you. And in a conversational context, right, it just gets much simpler. People have these, you know, these sort of nested intents, right? I have this intent to buy this product today. Really, I have this intent to do all the shopping for all of my family. Really, I have this bigger intent, which is I want to I want to show my family how I care for them and I want to be thoughtful and, and give them and make them feel good. Right. And so that nesting, right, is if you're a bit if you run a business and you can have a conversation where someone is telling you the bigger picture, what they really need, and you can learn about that bigger picture and help them solve that and also see what are those bigger pictures for all my customers and how do they really add up? And that's a big part of NLU, natural language understanding, helping you become a better. And so it's, in a lot of ways, that's what we sell. In addition, of course, we sell conversations at scale, right? We want to make it possible for brands to have these conversations with, with lots of customers and, and usefully. Uh, and so that means we do a lot of conversational AI. You are listening to the Aldis Podcast. When you're looking to scale your team or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions, www.aldis.com. I want to spend some time now understanding the 
the engineering, the data science, the machine learning that happens behind the scenes to, to take one of these uh, projects or, or, or product use cases to market. Can you give us some insight into what the, the project lifecycle looks like for, a, for an example project from when you guys get approached by, by a customer with a specific objective and idea? How do you and the, and the data science team go about uh, making that happen? Yeah, so we and the data science team are in the are in the business of building and supporting productized things. So what we don't do uh, is we don't show up at a customer's doorstep and build a bespoke solution for them. A customer is a brand in this case. What we do is we build data science and machine learning applications that get folded into the product. And then when a big brand like a T-Mobile or whatever buys that product, then we build technology and, and user experiences and APIs that they can use to solve the problems that the, the salespeople of our product have told them they can solve with our stuff. And so the way the company works, right? When the product is sold, you sell this whole platform. Okay, now you can communicate on SMS, you can, you can communicate inside your app, you can communicate online in Japan, you can communicate on WeChat, whatever, many channels of communication you've now opened up as a brand that you can reach out asynchronously or respond asynchronously from your customer base and have conversations through. And, and so typically that means they come in and then it'll be, depending on the size of the business and the scope of the engagement, it'll be anywhere from one to several months where they build what they need and what they want on the platform to start with. And that, that can either be a, a vanilla, a very vanilla use case where just cool, I just want to get my people talking to my customers on your platform. More often than not, that nowadays, almost every time, they also want to start building in some conversational AI. And a lot of times they also want to start building in some consumer understanding as well. So when they build in conversational AI, there's a bunch of use cases that the platform typically supports that they can turn on a quote unquote chat bot. I don't love that term, but I think we haven't found a, another one in the industry yet that we settled on. So we'll live with it for now. We have ways to help them build great conversational AI experiences through these chat bots uh, and, and uh, ways to, for that to be a measured and, and tested experience that I think are really innovative and a managed experience. And then finally, so they'll turn that on, they'll build those, they'll start to to tend their garden of conversational experiences, automated experiences, that is. And then finally, a lot of customers will turn on this consumer understanding as well that I mentioned that's related to NLU, right? So now they're able to categorize the types of consumer intents that they want to recognize. They're able to train models to do that on our platform in a very straightforward way using uh, examples of conversations that have occurred on their platform, that the, the platform, or sorry, that occurred on our platform, that the platform will sort of serve for them to use and to, to train with, and they can see how well those models are working. And then they can go in and, and, and use those like, okay, how often are my customers coming in and trying to solve this particular problem? Or am I seeing a problem that's spiking? And they'll be able to use that to manage their business. I think a really simple example that we've had is we've had major telcos use their customers' conversations to more quickly detect outages in their service then they've been able to detect with their own network operations center sometimes and there's this power of the, the aggregated voice of your customer coming at you that brands will want to turn on as well and about maybe about half of the big brands that we work with today maybe a little more are seeking to turn that on and make it a significant part of their investment joe you and i were speaking off air prior to the interview about the difference between cloud native, digital native, and AI native. Can you give us some insight into to what your view is on the importance of AI native as a, a leader of a data team working at an AI company? Yeah, I, I think so for sure. It's a concept that's very important to us at Live Person and all the way up to our CEO, Rob is super passionate about this. And the way I would explain it conceptually is in the same way that if you're a digital native, you, you don't really have to think too hard to gain an intuitive understanding of how to use some kind of digital product, right? Unless it's very poorly designed, you have just a, a sort of a, an intuitive arsenal of like things that you try and expectations that you have that allow you to make sense out of the kind of digital reality that's put in front of you. And, and the same, I think, is probably going to become begin to happen to us as we interact with more and more advanced forms of artificial intelligence, which we're really at the beginning of right now. I don't want to overpaint the picture. We're not out there talking to talking robots all the time or even communicate nearly as effectively as we want to in using our own language and our own gestures and our own native ways. But it is it is beginning. Uh, and I think it, it will be something that, that more and more people will naturally fall into. And then there'll be you know, probably the similar thing that happened with digital, where there's like a, a generation of people that go one way or the other, depending on how much interest and, and intention they put towards keeping track 
hacking and understanding what's going on. I, so this really gets interesting and important when you start to think about machines that are responding to your words and, and what you can expect them to do versus what you can't expect them to do or what you can expect them to understand well versus what you can't. And, and maybe even the ante gets up even more as those machines start to communicate back with you in natural language. Because I think we don't have a good, most people don't have a good theory of mind for a conversational system yet. And, and we see this, we did some qualitative research and we see people usually do one of two things when they talk to a conversational AI system, they either treat it like a search engine, one word, and they browbeat it with their single word, like bill, pay bill, pay bill. And, and then it gets stuck or, or they'll go the other way and they'll just treat it completely like a human, right? They'll give it five paragraphs of stuff. And if you know anything about a natural language uh, understanding, you'll know that that's a very like strict or, or stiff challenge for a system to be able to deal with. And so it, it, in my view, and this is just my opinion, I spent some time working on this, so take it for what it's worth. We're gonna have five, 10, 15 years of some evolution here. And we're at the beginning of that evolution where the facility of these systems as we talk to them and as we interact with them, slowly changes and grows. Uh, and I think especially early on, uh, it'll be important for a couple of reasons to, to become familiar with how these things work and, and what your expectations should be. Early on, it's important because you want to make sure you get the most out of these machines in the same way that some people are really good at working with search engines and have like a knack for that, especially 10 years ago, this was a bigger issue. We'll, we'll have the same thing with conversing with conversational systems. And so you'll get your stuff done, having a, a little bit of a theory of mind that'll be helpful. Uh, and then as time goes on, it'll, it becomes helpful for a different reason, because the more natural and reasonable these things sound and appear in everyday life, the more easy it would be to misunderstand them in, in nerve wracking ways. Right? So I think a, a really great example for this, you can look at the GPT-3 system, right? Which is an, the open AI language model that, that sort of had this great unveiling and writing its own article about itself. And you couldn't tell that, that, that it wasn't written by a human. And that's amazing, right? And there are many amazing things when you interact with this system and this language model and, and this language generating capability that you can create from that, that are like really feel very, and you can ask it all sorts of questions. It'll give you all sorts of answers because this thing is trained on almost the entire internet, but it gets a little funky sometimes, right? So you can ask the system, who was the president of the United States in 1781? It'll correctly say John Adams or, or George Washington, whoever it was, and I forget exactly who it was in 81. But the point is you can ask, it'll correctly know president yeah. of the United States, but you can also go back and ask who was the president in 1659 when there wasn't a president and it'll go and give you a legitimately reasonable historical figure that sort of feels presidential, like an important colonial official of some kind. Uh, and if you don't have, and, and that's very, that could be very misleading if you weren't aware of the context. Um, it's, it's a joke if you understand the basics of U.S. history, but for someone who doesn't, or for a more subtle case and more nuanced case, there, there are challenges with communicating with these systems and, and, not, and models don't always know. In fact, model, like machine learning models very rarely know a lot about you know how right or how wrong they are they're not always great at insight typically what we find we build these systems is that you actually want to build a second system that's watching the first system and has some insight about you know how well it, it's working independent of its own understanding mm -hmm. so i think you know this problem like right now talking to gpt or something like that is a bit of a it, it's a bit of an edge case right they're they're you know interested scientists and technologists and people doing that. But you can bet that some of this technology will start to make its way into everybody's life. And you can also bet there's not going to be perfect based on the way these algorithms work. They don't just come up with the best possible answer. They come up with like very good generalizing algorithms that are often right and maybe more right than humans, but that doesn't mean they're always right. And that sometimes when they're wrong, they can be wrong in dangerous ways. So as a the concept of becoming an AI native is really about knowing enough to reason about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and, and all these things so that when you see systems in the wild, you interact with systems in the wild, you can use them with a maximal effectiveness, and you can also protect yourself and your understanding where, where you'll not only get the most out of them, but also avoid some pitfalls. Joe, final question from me. You've been with live person almost four years now and you've built and grown a very successful data team which consists of data scientists data engineers machine learning folk when you speak to candidates about 
live person? What is it that you tell them that gets them excited about this particular piece of work over some of the other companies that are out there? Yeah, I think there's a couple of dimensions. Everybody's a little different, so different things resonate with them. But but I, I think a few of the things that are important to me about the culture and that I won't want to be important to someone. And so in some ways, you know, you, you want to tailor that pitch to the community you're building so that you keep building it. Some of those things are, one, the problem that we have and the data that we have to support it and the resources that we have to learn about that. Those, those probably from a pure science perspective, I think are the most exciting things. And I think there are things that are they're very unique to live persons. So the fact that we have billions of goal-oriented dialogues, anybody who's working on conversational AI would love to have that. And, and very few companies have that human-to-human dialogues. There are companies out there that have human-to-machine dialogues, but as human-to-machine dialogues are pretty limited right now compared to how humans talk to each other. And that's what we that's where we really want to go. The fact that we have tens of thousands of potential annotators sitting on top of the platform right now in a productized way for them within the platform to make annotations to give feedback to these understanding and, gener- and generative systems, that is also this kind of incredible resource that's very rare. So that this annotation at the scale we can do of data and the scale of data we have in the first place to me are, I don't know of other companies that, that really have what we have. I know some that come close, but most of them aren't doing the kind of innovation scientifically that, that we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I also really care about the culture. I, for one, believe very strongly and now have a lot of evidence through my career to support this belief that the best science and machine learning teams are teams that combine the truth seeking and the very literal and like very precise questioning native characteristic of the scientific mindset. They combine that with a sort of collaborativeness and a kindness and understanding a little bit of humanity together so that not only do you have really smart people who ask really good questions and can be really tough on ideas, but they are able to work together and support each other so they can work better, faster, smarter than they can do alone. Uh, and, and I feel like I, I've seen, I saw this a lot when I was a physicist and I've seen it in other in groups in the technology industries as well. Oftentimes you get the first without the second and you end up, you can end up with a kind of caustic and difficult environment to w- work in. What happens is people don't ask, like they're too afraid to ask dumb questions, quote unquote. They're too afraid to expose themselves on what they don't know. And you don't really get the kind of growth and learning and performance out of out of people as you can because they don't you haven't created an environment in which they can get better. And there's nothing special about a scientist or a machine learning engineer in that sense any more than anybody else. We all need we all thrive, we all do better, we all create more, we produce more. Or and we're just generally happier in an environment where we feel like we can grow. So that's one of the things we try and try pretty hard to build a live person. I'm pretty proud of, of the team we put together in that way. I think it does meet and raise the bar on all those values. As you should be, because you've I've, I've seen some of the people who are working there, and you really have brought together an incredible squad. Joe, thank you so much for today. Really appreciate you coming on and sharing a bit about your own journey, how you've got to where you're at today. Most importantly, the, the work that you're doing now with Live Person. It's an amazing use of this technology and it also sounds like a great place to work. So we appreciate you sharing with us. All right. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a pleasure for me as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Oldest Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.aldis.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon. Thank you.